So there's now real world evidence from the UK who has administered the AstraZeneca vaccine to people 65 years and over. This evidence demonstrates that the vaccine is safe in those studies and effective in older adults, particularly against severe COVID-19 disease and hospitalization. In light of the new evidence that emerged in those two real world effectiveness data, NASI met to review these data from the studies, two of which are large population level studies of good quality, demonstrating that AstraZeneca vaccine is safe and effective in older adults, in particular against severe disease such as hospitalization, including in adults over the age of 80 with significant medical comorbidities. Next slide, please. Alors, la première étude que nous avons étudiée est celle de Hyams, qui, euh, dont le titre est Assessing the Effectiveness of BNT162B2 and Chadox1 um, and COVID-19 COVID Vaccination in Prevention of Hospitalization in Elderly and Frail Adults, a Single Center Test Negative Case Control Study. Alors, il s'agit d'une étude cas témoin à test né négatif de personnes hospitalisées de 80 ans et plus. La, beaucoup euh, dans ce groupe-là étaient fragiles avec des comorbidités, euh, hospitalisés dans deux hôpitaux de Bristol au Royaume-Uni. La vaccination a été déterminée par couplage d'enregistrement et un ajustement a été effectué pour un certain nombre de facteurs. L'efficacité du vaccin contre l'hospitalisation a été évaluée chez ceux qui avaient été vaccinés au moins quatre jours, 14 jours avant l'apparition des symptômes. En termes de résultats, cette étude démontrait l'efficacité de terrain d'une dose de vaccin à 80,4 contre l'hospitalisation survenue dans les 14 à 53 jours après une dose de vaccin contre la COVID-19 chez les patients de 80 ans et plus. Quand nous avons évalué cette étude, nous l'avons considérée de bonne qualité avec un faible risque de biais. La vaccination a été déterminée par couplage de dossiers et les informations cliniques ont été obtenues à partir des dossiers par les personnes qui étaient à du PCR COVID chez les participants. Cette étude présente des points forts sur le plan méthodologique et l'analyse complète se trouve dans la déclaration. Prochaine diapo, s'il vous plaît. The second study that uh, we looked at was the one from Lopez Bernal, Early Effectiveness of COVID-19 Vaccination with the Pfizer mRNA Vaccine and the AstraZeneca Adenovirus Vector Vaccine on Symptomatic Disease, Hospitalizations and Mortality in Older Adults in England. This one is also preprint. So this again is a test negative case control study design using linked surveillance data in the UK among patients 70 years of age and older. For those who were vaccinated, cases and controls were assessed by time since vaccination to onset of symptoms, controlling for a number of factors. The impact of vaccination and hospitalization in those individuals was in age 80 years and older was also assessed in those who tested positive. The results of this study showed that one dose vaccine effectiveness against symptomatic PCR-confirmed COVID infection in the adjusted analysis was 22% from day 14 to 20 after vaccination, which gradually rose up to 73%, 35 to 48 days after vaccination. On top of that, the effect against symptomatic disease in individuals who were 80 and over was an additional 37% protection against hospitalization within 14 days of a positive test in those 14 or more, more days after their vaccine dose compared to those who were unvaccinated. We deemed this study of good quality with low risk of bias. And again, the record linkage um, was done using large data sets, which is a strength of this study. And again, the full analysis can be found in the statement. Next slide, please. La dernière étude qui avait été évaluée en fait avant le 1er mars était celle de Vassile Yu, Effectiveness of First Dose COVID-19 Vaccine Against Hospitalizations and Hospital Admissions in Scotland, Effectiveness Findings from Scotland National Perspective Cohort Study of 5.4 million, which is a preprint again on the Lancet website. Juste pour vous dire qu'en raison de préoccupations liées aux faiblesses méthodologiques de cette étude, euh, le CCNI n'avait pas utilisé ces résultats pour, essayer, pour étayer ses recommandations. En fait, un, euh, nous avions évalué que cette étude était à haut risque de biais et que par ailleurs, euh, l'étude avait démontré une efficacité très élevée de la vaccination à prévenir les hospitalisations dans les deux premières semaines suivant la, vac la vaccination, ce qui est biologiquement peu plausible. Euh, encore, l'analyse complète se retrouve dans la déclaration et dans ce contexte, euh, comme je l'ai dit précédemment, 
nous n'avions pas utilisé cette étude pour modifier euh, notre euh, recommandation. Next slide, please. So following this careful review, NACI decided to expand the recommendations for the use of the AstraZeneca vaccine to include those 65 years of age and over. NACI will continue to closely monitor data from ongoing clinical trials and evidence from real, real world use of the AstraZeneca vaccine, and that includes um, safety, and we'll revise our recommendation as needed. Next slide, please. Donc, pour le futur, donc le CCNI, le CCNI publiera une déclaration complète référencée sur l'utilisation d'un intervalle prolongé entre les doses. Nous sommes en train de réviser les données pour le vaccin Janssen de Johnson Johnson. Euh, prévoyons une recommandation euh, dans quelques semaines. Euh, L'examen du vaccin Novavax est prévu euh, dans quelques semaines, donc nous n'avons pas encore vu les, les données de Novavax et euh, l'examen du nombre optimum, optimal de doses de vaccin pour les personnes précédemment infectées par le SRAS-CoV-2 euh, sera étudié dans la semaine du 22 mars avec, euh, nous espérons, une recommandation dans les jours qui suivront. Euh, next slide, please. Vous pouvez, you can see the full update um, using that link. Next slide, please. And um, you have NACI membership here. Um, so as I said, this type of technical briefing will be done moving forward with every NACI release. It's not that we had anything particular to say at this point in time more than what was in the statement. Um, and just so people know, um, in addition, the, in the interval recommendation, we are also going to be studying um, uh, immunocompromised um, people uh, because a few um, papers have been released recently. So we are keeping on top of the um, literature and are modifying as need be, but um, we know that uh, the evidence move quickly. And so it sometimes is difficult to understand exactly what has been reviewed for which statement release. Thank you. Thank you. Merci, uh, Dr. Quash. Uh, we'll now move to the question and answer period. Uh, I remind you to just simply use the raise your hand feature on Zoom if you want to ask a question. Les journalistes qui veulent, pose, qui veulent poser des questions peuvent le faire en utilisant la fonction lever la main dans Zoom. Alors, on va commencer cette période avec Raymond Fillon. Raymond Fillon, première question, donc. Oui, merci beaucoup, Martin. Bonjour. Une question peut-être pour Dr Bertium, qui représente Santé Canada, parce qu'on ne vous a pas encore entendu publiquement là-dessus, Santé Canada, l'histoire des caillots sanguins du vaccin AstraZeneca. Ma question, compte tenu des inquiétudes, pourquoi Santé Canada ne suspend pas le vaccin AstraZeneca comme l'ont fait une vingtaine d'autres pays, ne serait-ce que par mesure de précaution? Merci pour votre question. Alors, Santé Canada est au courant des, 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 de que certains pays européens ont mis sur pause la vaccination euh, avec le vaccin AstraZeneca. Euh, il y a eu des cas qui ont été rapportés d'effets secondaires thromboemboliques dans certains pays européens. Euh, cependant, je dois vous dire qu'il y a une analyse qui est en cours au niveau de l'Agence européenne du médicament avec des discussions aujourd'hui puis une réunion euh, prévue jeudi. Euh, à ce moment-ci, sur la base des données que l'on a au Canada, euh, les, euh, les, le nombre d'effets de, indésirables un bon embolique rapporté est très en deçà de ce qui pourrait être attendu euh, dans une population euh, juste par la survenue normale de ces effets indésirables. Euh, donc, les effets indésirables peuvent survenir euh, dans la population et donc aussi chez des gens qui ont été vaccinés. Ça n'établit pas nécessairement un lien de causalité entre euh, l'événement euh, thromboembolique et le fait que la personne a pris un vaccin. Donc, il doit y avoir une investigation poussée. Chacun des cas euh, en Europe va être investi par l'Agence européenne du médicament. On est en consultation, en, en communication constante avec eux. Euh, actuellement, je dois dire aussi qu'au Canada, euh, les lots qui ont été distribués ne euh, sont pas les mêmes lots qui ont été distribués en Europe. Les lots du vaccin d'AstraZeneca euh, qui sont distribués au Canada euh, sont des lots euh, qui sont développés sous licence par le, le un, un, une compagnie qui s'appelle le Serum Institute of India. Puis éventuellement, euh, s'il y a des lots d'AstraZeneca qui viennent au Canada, il serait possiblement euh, de source d'une 
d'une production qui serait autre que celle qui a, de, de, des lots là, qui ont été euh, utilisés en Europe. Donc, à ce moment-ci, Santé Canada suit le, le, les événements, mais considère que, euh, compte tenu des risques associés euh, à la COVID-19 et aux bénéfices de la vaccination, euh, il est préférable de, de continuer euh, à être vacciné euh, avec les vaccins disponibles au Canada, y compris le vaccin euh, d'AstraZeneca, qui est considéré à, à l'heure actuelle sur la base des données disponibles sur efficacité et de qualité. Merci. Question de suivi. Oui, question de suivi. Donc, il n'y a aucune preuve qui démontre un lien, surtout avec les lots qu'on a au Canada, si je vous comprends bien, mais vous n'avez pas l'assurance qu'il n'y a pas de lien. Est-ce exact? C'est-à-dire que, comme j'expliquais, ce qu'on doit garder en tête, c'est que des événements indésirables peuvent survenir euh, suite à, à l'inoculation d'un vaccin. Ensuite, on doit déterminer est-ce qu'il y a un lien entre ces effets indésirables-là et le vaccin. Sur la base, par exemple, des données que l'on a pour le vaccin, le vaccin AstraZeneca, où presque 24 000 personnes ont été inoculées avec le vaccin dans les essais cliniques, euh, le taux de survenue des effets secondaires thromboemboliques était plus bas dans le groupe vacciné que dans les groupes contrôle. Ce qui veut dire que quand on contrôle de façon aléatoire puis on répartit euh, les sujets dans les études, euh, il n'y a aucune évidence que le, le vaccin d'AstraZeneca à l'intérieur des essais cliniques cause des, des effets secondaires thromboemboliques. Je dois aussi rajouter que jusqu'à maintenant, il y a, les effets secondaires thromboemboliques ne sont pas des effets secondaires qui ont été associés de façon typique avec les vaccinations en général. Mais ceci dit, Santé Canada euh, continue d'investiguer la chose. Au Canada, on n'a pas eu de rapport d'effet indésirable euh, avec euh, le, le vaccin euh, d'AstraZeneca de nature thromboembolique. Il y a eu deux cas de nature thromboembolique qui ont été rapportés avec le vaccin de Pfizer. Euh, puis je dois dire aussi que euh, l'information quand même que l'on a actuellement, c'est qu'il y a eu 17 millions de doses qui ont été distribuées euh, en, en Europe du vaccin d'AstraZeneca et inoculées. Euh, puis les cas rapportés euh, sont dans quelques dizaines de cas, alors que les cas attendus seraient probablement plus dans quelques centaines de cas. Euh, donc, il faut garder ça en tête. Il faut éviter de prendre là, des décisions hâtives sur la base des informations que l'on a actuellement. Euh, tout semble indiquer que le vaccin est sûr euh, à l'heure actuelle. Mais comme je vous dis, on continue de suivre la chose euh, d'heure en heure, de jour en jour. Puis s'il y a des changements à la position de Santé Canada, ça va être communiqué immédiatement là, euh, aux, aux différentes instances et au public en général. Merci beaucoup. I will now move to Mackenzie Gray. Hi there. My first question is for Dr. Berthium. I know you just answered this in French, but if you just go over to English as well, too. I mean, what's Health Canada doing to track uh, the safety of the AstraZeneca vaccine, considering many European allies have uh, stopped using it right now? Yes, uh, thank you for your question. So Health Canada is actively monitoring the ongoing uh, situation in Europe. As you are aware, uh, many uh, European countries have paused their vaccination uh, and uh, because they're currently investigating a number of cases that, that has been reported in uh, different countries that are thromboembolic adverse event. Um, based on the information that Health Canada um, has uh, reviewed, the number of cases of thrombonic adverse, adverse event at this point in time are uh, lower than the rates that would be expected in uh, the population uh, that has been vaccinated with the AstraZeneca vaccine. So uh, we are aware of those cases. We are in uh, direct communication with the European Medicines Agency and with the, the sponsor. Uh, we are looking uh, to get uh, additional information about the case. Uh, the, the pharmacovigilance uh, Uh, regulatory uh, committee in Europe uh, will uh, discuss the issue today and will uh, convene a meeting on Thursday where uh, more information will be uh, provided. At this point in time, based on the information uh, that has been uh, uh, distributed by uh, and uh, reviewed by Health Canada, uh, there is no uh, safety concern with the thromboembolic adverse event because the lower uh, the uh, the uh, number of events are lower than expected expected, but we're actively looking into the issue. So overall, Health Canada considers that uh, the benefits of the vaccines, uh, considering the risk of contracting COVID infection and its associated uh, complication, um, are, are, are outweigh the, any risk that potentially be associated uh, with the vaccine. Thank you. Follow up. 
Yeah, my follow-up question is for Dr. Quash. Uh, I think it was on March 1st that NASI put out its recommendation that uh, AstraZeneca shouldn't be given to people over 65. And I know this isn't your fault, but then on the second uh, new data comes out and then on the third new data comes out, um, why did NASI wait so long after receiving what seems to be fairly concrete data that it's okay for 65-year-olds to get the vaccine? And how much damage do you think uh, people will think of getting this vaccine? Because originally it was not for 65, now it is for 65. There's a lot of moving parts for this. You think, are you concerned that people would be uh, hesitant to get this because of uh, the moving parts? Well, I think that everything that is moving tends to create uh, raise questions. Um, in terms of uh, the sequence of events, NASI was working on different questions at that point in time. And given the fact that these data were coming out and the fact that there were other uh, alternatives in terms of vaccines available in Canada for the elderly population, we didn't necessarily modify the sequence of events. Um, maybe I can refer this to Matthew Tunis, the executive secretary of NASI, just because the process is more with the secretariat, but there were, I mean, the teams were busy with other files. Um, Matthew, I don't know if you can add anything to this. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I, as Dr. Quash mentioned, the, the, you know, the committee is very busy, obviously meeting weekly to discuss uh, all the emerging data and these important topics. So there's always inevitably going to be a bit of a lag between when a committee deliberates and when the advice is uh, is made public. And as we've seen with this pandemic, as you mentioned, I mean, new data are coming out every day. And so um, it's, it's an inherent feature of this kind of deliberative committee where we bring together these experts, convene them um, based on the available evidence so they can make, make a decision at a point in time. Then that decision is made public. And as more evidence emerges, then the committee reconvenes, deliberates again, and updates their advice as they can. And I mean, there's there's really no other way to ensure a, a, a robust, um, you know, stable discussion among a committee of so many experts. Uh, that, so I, I think it's a, we're going to continue to see this throughout the pandemic as new evidence emerges and is onboarded. Um, that recommendations are going to have to change, and it might be that the the evidence comes days after a decision. It might be weeks after a decision or months. Um, but, you know, we have no control over where data is coming from and uh, it's impossible to predict the future about what's going to come out on which day so it's um i think it's to some extent the uh you know the, the nature of trying to do these careful deliberative decisions in this dynamic environment thank you and and maybe i will just add that at that point in time we were hoping to get the phase three or the randomized control trial um, from astrazeneca that is currently done in the us which includes more um, participants age 65 and over we had the impression that these data would be available early to mid-March. And therefore we said, you know, we, we see that there are studies coming out, but if we are going to change recommendation based on real world evidence, and if, if the phase three shows something different, um, what would move the needle most? And so at one point in time, you know, you try and do some risk mitigation at that point in time, um, we thought that that AstraZeneca study would be ready. And then we learned um, later on in the week that it wouldn't be ready before April. And that's when we decided to um, look at the real world evidence and, and change our recommendation. But I think as, as um, Matthew said, it's easy looking backward to say, oh, you didn't have more data, so it was easy, you should have done it. But moving forward, it's, there's always a cost of opportunity. So if you are to change something based on, on data from the real world that are in terms of um, hierarchy of uh, data quality, a little bit lower than randomized control trials data. And if your randomized control trial comes out the day after showing the opposite, then we would have been um, in a bind. So easy to say now that we should have, but moving forward, we did that in all good faith um, and tried to evaluate our options. Thank you. Thank you. On va poursuivre avec uh, Mélanie Merki. Merci, Martin. Je m'excuse pour le délai. Euh, la question est pour Docteur Quash. Comment euh, réconcilier le fait que le comité, aujourd'hui, ouvre la porte plus grande à l'administration du vaccin AstraZeneca au fait qu'il y a 
toutes ces préoccupations euh, en Europe. On a l'impression qu'eux appuient sur la pédale de frein alors que, que nous, on va plein gaz. Comment, euh, comment faire passer le message? C'est une excellente question qu'on s'est posée hier. Euh, en fait, euh, compte tenu euh, que les médias savaient déjà tous qu'on avait changé notre recommandation, puisque on s'en était parlé. Euh, euh, hier soir, en fait, euh, tout le monde disait que, que le CCNI avait modifié sa recommandation. On s'est donc dit qu'il fallait en parler et euh, expliquer que, euh, on, que, que Santé Canada, en fait, continue à faire le suivi des, euh, de ce qui se passe en Europe. Euh, je pense que les, la, notre recommandation n'est pas en lien avec ce qui se passe en Europe. Notre recommandation est vraiment en lien avec les données euh, de, de, de Real World Effectiveness là, qui ont été publiées euh, début mars. Et dans ce contexte, ce, qu ce que je disais tout à l'heure, c'est que présentement, ce qu'on dit, c'est qu'il peut être utilisé, mais qu'évidemment, quand on évalue la balance des risques versus bénéfices, si jamais Santé Canada nous dit qu'effectivement, euh, il y a un enjeu, euh, on, on modifiera la recommandation, mais c'est le problème d'avoir un comité qui fonctionne avec des experts qui se rencontrent à toutes les semaines, où il y a un processus euh, très strict à suivre, où les données doivent être revues, délibérées, euh, rédigées, approuvées, tra traduites, et donc on n'est jamais capable de sortir une recommandation en, en deçà de 7 à 10 jours suivant la la rencontre plénière. Euh, et donc, je pense, encore une fois, là, il y avait une, une, une mitigation de risque où on s'est dit, soit on ne sort pas notre avis, mais il est déjà, en fait, dans les faits sorti puisque tout le monde en parlait. Et on attend où on fait cette recommandation-là puis on permet la discussion là, autour des données qui existent présentement où le, le, le lien de causalité n'est pas encore euh, euh, retenu. Pour, euh, en question de suivi, toujours euh, pour vous, puis peut-être euh, Dr Bertillon aussi, si vous voulez vous euh, lancer dans, dans la mêlée, je sais que, bon, vous n'êtes pas le gouvernement, mais compte tenu qu'il y a une certaine hésitation, qu'il y a une population âgée de 65 ans et plus qui va hésiter à se faire administrer de vaccins, est-ce que ce ne serait pas sage de revoir un peu les listes de priorités pour s'organiser que, par exemple, le vaccin d'AstraZeneca soit donné en priorité à des populations plus, euh, plus jeunes? Ça, je vous dirais que ça relève des, euh, des, des, des provinces et des territoires. Euh, nous, quand vous lisez notre recommandation, on demande, en fait, notre recommandation demeure préférentielle pour les vaccins à ARN messagers dans les groupes à plus haut risque de complications. Euh, nous avons quand même euh, libéralisé l'utilisation du vaccin d'AstraZeneca pour les personnes plus âgées. Mais euh, après ça, euh, les, les, les provinces pourront décider de l'utiliser comme elles voudront. Je pense que l'idée, c'était de permettre cette flexibilité-là aux provinces et aux territoires euh, pour, que le, pour, pour euh, augmenter en fait, l'offre de vaccination pour être capable de vacciner le plus de personnes possible. Je pense qu'il faut quand même réaliser que dans les études, de, de, dans la vraie vie, là, euh, que le vaccin d'AstraZeneca avait quand même une efficacité de terrain entre 70 et 80 quelques pourcents à prévenir les hospitalisations et les décès après une première dose, telle que rapportée par les études, les deux grandes études faites en Grande-Bretagne. Je ne sais pas si Dr Bertion peut rajouter quelque chose. Euh, oui, merci Dr Kwashtan. Peut-être juste préciser que dans le fond, l'ordre de priorisation des groupes pour la vaccination est déterminé par, euh, euh, sous les conseils de, le, du Comité consultation national d'immunisation, bien ultimement c'est dé, déterminé par les autorités de santé publique. Le rôle de Santé Canada, c'est vraiment d'approuver les, euh, les, euh, les vaccins sur la base des données qui sont fournies, puis ensuite euh, la, les, les la priorisation, dans le fond, de lequel le vaccin est le plus indiqué, plus utile, le mieux pour tel groupe, ces déterminations-là sont faites par la suite par d'autres groupes que Santé Canada. Merci. Uh, we'll now move, we'll now go to David Thurton. Hi. Uh, the audio is great during this press conference. We've had some issues with it in past Zoom ones, so thank you. I will say that someone's, uh, I think, phone keeps going off. Uh, it sounds like a horn. You might want to just put that on mute. And, and that's if, mine. I'm sorry. I'm on call. 
<laughs> okay, totally. I, I, oh, I did not know that. Apologies for that. And if there's any way that we could see the person who's speaking full screen, this is not anything that the, the people on the call can do. It's the people in the background. Uh, I know my TV colleagues would appreciate that. Right now we're seeing like a, a full box version, but it's fine. The sound is great. So I appreciate that. So here's my question. Uh, if I heard you correctly, uh, Dr. Quash, you're saying that where possible, the mRNA vaccine should be prioritized for uh, people above the age of 65. Um, I, I'm just wondering, in, in, this, in this period where people seem to be hesitant when it comes to vaccines, where you know people are, are, are saying they, they, will, they, they want, only want to choose certain vaccines, are you not afraid that this will worsen that situation or even encourage vaccine shopping? Yeah, no, I understand what you're saying. I think that um, what NASI is uh, aiming to do is to look at the evidence and try and give um, data that are, you know, recommendations that are as much as possible um, hinging on those evidence. As I said, the mRNA vaccines had higher efficacy in clinical trials, in particular for those 65 years and over. I understand that in the AstraZeneca trial, there were less people 65 years and over, which could have made the vaccine estimate much less precise. However, these are the data we have. Um, if, if the phase three trial that is currently ongoing in the US with AstraZeneca in with a larger um, number of people age 65 and over shows us that that vaccine efficacy is similar then we will change our recommendation. But I'm not sure how to um, reconcile the 95% efficacy of the Pfizer Moderna vaccine to the 75% of the AstraZeneca without um, putting some you know, differential um, recommendation there. And yes, I understand that um, you know, it would be easier to be able to say um, that all vaccines are equivalent. I think that from an efficacy perspective, they do not seem to be all equivalent, although it is very hard to um, compare all those vaccines head to head. However, we are currently, again, reviewing the real world effectiveness of the Pfizer compared to um, Moderna and um, AstraZeneca. And once all that is completed, if we see that in terms of vaccine effectiveness, the, the other vaccines are similar in terms of um, protection against hospitalization, complications and death, it's possible that this recommendation changes. Um, ideally, you know, we would do one recommendation with all the data in hand, but that's impossible. So that's why, you know, you start with one thing and you start chewing that elephant slide, slice by slice. Um, I understand that it's not um, the ideal, the ideal situation in terms of knowledge translation. It's then up to the communication people to chew that up. Um, we make we make um, recommendations to the Public Health Agency of Canada, um, and then the Public Health Agency of Canada will communicate that recommendation out. Um, so again, as I said before, we are an independent committee, and that what is that is what the committee concluded which doesn't seem that it's not which doesn't mean that it's not going to change but at this point in time that is where we um, stand with the recommendation i don't know if uh, matthew has uh, anything to add no okay thanks no thank you uh, yes thank you for that dr quash uh, just coming back to the big news out of this presser you're changing your recommendation for AstraZeneca. You're now recommending it for people above the age of 65. I, I, I do have to ask, though, this is a change that we're seeing, you know, in, in, matter, in a span of two weeks. Do you regret, uh, Dr. Quash or, 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 or Matthew, the unintended consequences of making this, this, this sudden change? And are you going to do anything diff for differently? Have you learned anything from this? You know, um, David, I think it's very complicated to know what's going to happen moving forward. When we did our recommendation end of February, it was issued March 1st, but we met um, end of February. 
We were in line with most countries in Europe. The data we had were the um, phase three trial data that AstraZeneca had submitted. And as I said, we had only one real world effectiveness from Scotland, which um, had validity methodological issues. And so at that point in time, the committee felt comfortable with what um, had been issued. In the week after, there were real world effectiveness data that came out and then European countries started to change their recommendations, not all of them, but some of them. Um, and, and as I said, the reason why we didn't jump right away on those real world effectiveness was because um, we were expecting the phase three trial data from the US to, to you know, unveil uh, in early March to mid-March. So we said, you know, it's if it's next week and those data are in contradiction with the real world effectiveness, we wouldn't, we will not have done anybody a service. So I think that people have to realize that it's not that we're flip-flopping, it's just that we try to monitor the evidence. I think the only thing that um, I would say would have been done differently is the communication support so that we would have been able to explain all this exactly as we're doing today. And so based on that, um, I think the Public Health Agency of Canada has now um, recognized that this support was absolutely necessary and this is now put in place. Could have been done earlier, but you know, it's the first pandemic of this size and it was the first time that we ran into so much um, complications. The unintended consequences, well, the provinces and territories were still able to use the vaccine as recommended by Health Canada. It was done in Quebec from the first week of March, like towards the end of that week. Um, others could have done the same. Um, again, it's always easier if Health Canada and NACI agree, but it doesn't have to be. It's not the first time it doesn't. It's not the first time NACI makes pre preferential recommendations. I think it's just the first time that people put so much um, spotlight on NASI's recommendation and, and uh, it's understandable. I mean, it's, you know, vaccines are what are going to um, get us out of um, this pandemic. But um, the, the way we function is the way we functioned before. In fact, we have had to increase the speed at which we are meeting and we are writing recommendations um, and we're approving them, which is an additional um, difficulty, I would say. But the only thing I would say is, had I known all of that would be coming down so that the um, phase two trial from the US not be available before mid-April to end of April, and those two vaccine effectiveness coming out the days after the recommendation was made public, we would have waited before issuing it. But how can one know? I mean, I'm asking you, if you have a better um, crystal ball than I have, then by all means, please send it to me. I'll take it in a flash. Let's have a few minutes left. Uh, we'll go to Mia Ramson. Oh, sorry, am I unmuted now? We hear you. <laughs> sorry. Um, I just had a bit of a follow up about the recommendation to still prioritize mRNA for for seniors. You said that the real world evidence was showing similar effectiveness. I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit more and why that's not enough to say uh, to, to not have that prioritization recommendation. Yeah, thank you for that question. I'm not saying it's not enough. I'm just saying that it hasn't been um, formally reviewed by the committee yet. So we have, we have the data and it's going to be presented to the committee. And as I said, it's because it is a committee of experts, it's impossible for me or for the executive to change a recommendation um, right away. It, you know, we have to look at the evidence, compare them, discuss them. And given everything else that has been going on in terms of moving parts, that is in the works, but is not yet finalized. So what I'm saying is it's possible that based on these real world evidence from the mRNA vaccines, that the preferential recommendation changes. But I can't um, presume of what the committee is going to say because it hasn't been debated yet. Okay, 
Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm also wondering, in the, the overall guidance, it says that Pfizer in particular can be used on kids, I believe, as young as 12. But my understanding is that they haven't been fully tested on anyone under 16. So I'm wondering why we can make that recommendation for that population. And also what knowledge you have of when other kids might be allowed. Is that our We've talked about the fact that everyone will get a vaccine by September, but it doesn't look like kids will be approved by then. So I'm just wondering if you can talk about kids a little bit and, and the vaccine. Yes, absolutely. So the 12 to 15 year old in the Pfizer data was um, based on data that were provided by the manufacturer upon um, their submission to Health Canada. They did not seek authorization because they didn't have enough data. But you know, similarly to people with uh, immunocompromising conditions, autoimmune diseases, pregnant women, we have left it in as a shared decision-making possibility. So that if you know a physician decides that um, that a, a given child is at very high risk and age, I don't know, 15, there is something in there because we have some data. We will not make any recommendation on the vaccine use in children before we have data from the phase three trials that are currently enrolling children. From our understanding, we should get some data in the next two to three months for at least the 12 to 15 year olds. And then as data are being accrued and are deemed to be, uh, the vaccines are deemed to be safe and immunogenic, then they will decrease in age range until they go down to the younger um, ones. But we're not expecting anything for children before the end of 2021. Maybe Dr. Bertium from Health Canada has a better um, knowledge of what data are coming in and when, but um, uh, we're not expecting anything anytime soon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kwashtan. No, not much to add. Uh, we should have uh, data from Pfizer in the coming months. Uh, data, data from Moderna maybe a, a bit later, but at this point in time, then the data will need to be reviewed and it's going to depend on what uh, can be derived in terms of efficacy from the data. So. Thank you. Merci. C'est ce qui complète notre brevage technique. This is the end of our technical briefing. If you, reporters, if you have additional questions, you can reach us at hc.media.sc at canada.ca. Donc, les journalistes qui ont des questions supplémentaires peuvent nous joindre au hc.media, sans accent évidemment, .sc à canada.ca. Bonne journée.